um, the last time I asked you to I ask you to do a homework, which is to fill up this table um, based on instructions given to you. And then for the last part, the proposed title, I ask you to, to look for a template that fits your, that would fit your title. And um, so I went over your submissions, uh, each group, and I, I had to, um, well, uh, to suggest or more actually to, to rework your, your assignment. Um, so I'm going to show now the titles, the working titles for each of the team, for team ICEE. So it's going to be a study on the effect of the work from home set up on interior design in the context of world or work productivity during the pandemic. For the Global Palawenio Architects, it's a study on the determinants of the surviving small resto bars amidst the pandemic in the context of Puerto Princesa. For Asia Architects, uh, it's a study on the link of public perception on the architectural profession and the actual practice in the context of Puerto Princesa, Palawan. And for Team EBSU, it's a study on the determinants of students not using the drafting studios in the context of the College of Architecture and Allied Discipline of Eastern Visayas State University. For Asia, I'm sorry. Um, yep, for Team EBSU, Okay, yeah, he went back. So Tim Duke, the architect, a study on the consequences of retaining the 50-year-old asbestos acoustic insulation in the context of the results theater in Cagayan de Oro. For Team MAR, a study on the link between cost efficiency and reduction of virus transmission in the context of wall claddings in response to the challenges of the pandemic in commercial interior design. Uh, for Team Charmander, this is actually um, in process. I hope that you will give me your final title. A study on the effect of easing the physical distancing in public transportation on, you have to state your scope, in the context of the COVID-19 situation in the Philippines, because I think you gave uh, three possible reasons why uh, for the study, three possible scopes. Um, I forgot about them, but uh, I my suggestion is to focus only on one um, because of all the constraints that we are facing in our class. For Green City Architects, a study on the relationship between the plants used in urban parks and their local environmental condition in the context of the rehabilitation of urban parks in Puerto Princesa. Okay, so basically those were the titles. So I call them working titles. I'm sure some of you might not like the way it was worded, but precisely we call it working title because it's temporary. Um, the way it's worded is actually uh, in all purposes correct and technically correct um, but you have to really follow instructions no, despite what you want because um, we are in this class so that I can train you um, I noticed the way you write that you need a lot of um, you still need a lot of critical thinking <laughs> analysis and also especially on arranging your thoughts um, and in, in communicating and expressing your thoughts, okay? In some, for some of you, um, it was very difficult to follow, although there's already the table, but what you write in the table uh, sometimes is wrong. It's as if you do not get the flow. Uh, so it's very, it's, it's difficult. And I, I sort of imagine also that most of you were like trained to be instinctive. Okay, to rely more on intuition. Now, um, this is intuition is good, 
uh, intuition is like thinking in an instant. So based on on what you were based on habits, okay. So based on what you've been doing many times. So sometimes you decide without they say without, without thinking, but actually uh, there was some thought into it. When you rely on intuition, your brain actually made a very very fast um, processing of the of the problem, and you came out with a solution immediately. Sometimes the solution is very instant um, in the way that, uh, okay, you, you, that's when, that's when we say that, okay, I, I acted on intuition, okay? But in the academe, especially where we are now, especially in the graduate studies, we have to know how to break our thought processes into uh, steps and to be able to explain them, okay? Um, wait. So, I will be tending my cat while I talk to you. So, why did I show this um, problem, a mathematical problem on the screen? Because this is one way of what is say breaking the problem into steps, okay? So the, this, the equation is 3x minus 4 is equal to 7x plus 8. I can solve that um, with a scratch paper maybe, a few, a, few, um, a few computations, and then I can get to the answer. In fact, I did that in very fast. No? But then um, in some exams, you are told to show your solution. And so you have to show it step by step. So like what you're seeing here in the screen. And then after you show the solution, you have to, to check your answer if it is really correct. And in research, it's the same. You have to show your solution. That's the methodology. And you have to tell, you have to tell me or you have to tell, or we have to write down uh, how you want to solve this problem step by step. Okay. And then how you want to check your solution if it is correct. And that's the validity check or reliability check. And that's when, that's where we, that's where statistics comes in. Okay, even in the field of qualitative um, research, um, some statistics might be involved in the checking. Okay, so we have to have that discipline. And I'm going to demand it from all of you um, because this is not the uh, undergrad. And um, besides, you, you chose this path. Uh, to take up the masters, you have to you have to have these qualifications. So if you do not have this training yet, you do not have this discipline yet, then you have to practice practice in breaking down your thoughts, practice in um, writing down all the processes, and making sure that it is orderly, so that anyone who reads it will not be confused. Because a lot of you write it as if it's already there, so it's very very clear to you, so you just write it, and then suddenly, when I'm the one reading it, I was I was confused. No, where did where did this come from? Suddenly, you mentioned it here in this uh, somewhere uh, below the table. So, I mean, the 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 table that you were filling up. No, um, you were saying something uh, at first, but then when you were writing down your title. You introduce a lot of ideas which were not discussed earlier. So everything has to be very, very uh, smooth no? in terms of reasoning. And whenever you write, you have to keep on, you have to have the discipline of putting it aside for a while and then reading it later and trying to improve on it until you can say that there's nothing else to improve. Okay. So because we have not even started writing yet, that's only the title. Um, what if we are about to write a paper or especially your thesis? So anyway, um, that's the direction that we're going, okay? So let's go directly to our topic in qualitative analysis, which is the analysis of visual data. Our first topic um, on this is the analysis of um, textual data. Now I gave you an assignment to look for a study, a published study, 
uh, which made use of analysis of textual data. Unfortunately, I have to invalidate the submissions and to I decided to cancel that assignment all, through, all throughout because um, well, some of the submissions were not really what I was looking for. Uh, as long as there is the word textual data, um, it seems that, okay, you, you submit it. So, and when I was reading them, and it, it's, just not the, it's just not the type of research that I was looking for. And I realized that looking for a research paper um, is really that difficult, so I decided to, to not push through with the checking. Um, and that means the same for this analysis of visual data. For example, when I was um, searching for reference materials for our discussion, I came up with uh, what we call um, here, no? um, data visualization. So sometimes you might be confused with uh, data visualization, which is actually like using graphs to explain data. But that is not what we are doing here. This, this is not, we're going to analyze visual data, not analyze uh, data on, based on visual presentations, okay? Um, visual data is defined as imagery or images or visual representation and pictorial metaphors representation. So those are the, these are the researchers who made the, um, the definitions. Uh, so what makes the qualitative, what makes the qualitative visual data? So when gathering visual empirical material for a research project, as with any other types of data, we frequently face a twofold choice between using already existing material and producing new ones, so created as a result of our intervention. Thus, we have participant-generated data, researcher-generated material, or use of already existing content, for example, photos or videos shared on the social media. So the visual data may came from, come from us or from the person who is also involved in the research, especially the participant, or it can be something already um, available which we can easily download because they are they have been uploaded for example in social media so nowadays social media is so powerful that it be, that even businesses or um, formal communication makes use of social media and sometimes even research um, makes use of social media but um, that's a danger because it should not be no? the first victim of social media in the world of the truth of, of veracity is the, the media itself, you know, the news media, who relied on social media for news um, and to the, uh, well, compromising the truth because as you know, social media is basically, oh, what did my cat do? Social media is basically relying only on, on um, popularity, okay? So the presentation was removed. Okay, so forms of participant created content. So they can be cartoons, collages, diagrams, drawings, films, mental maps. I will explain mental maps later in an example. Photography, pictures, schemes, sketches, sculptures, and timelines. So again, diagrams, for example, or sketches, timelines. So these are not the uh, representation of data. So not like graph, okay? So you already have data and then you, you communicate it through graph. So that's not what we are analyzing, okay? What we're analyzing is, data, is visual data as data itself, as raw data. 
So some procedure in generating visual data. So the draw and write technique, according to Hartel. Um, and then I'll just read through this because most of them are actually very simple. Graphic visual elicitation method, or that is drawing or timelines which use images to draw interview discussion. So you ask someone to, uh, to draw. So to represent mental models, to solicit people's conceptualization. This is what Kevin Lynch is trying to do when he wrote the image of the city book. He asked some people to draw the idea of, uh, of this and that, about wayfinding. Yes? Um, is there someone who wants to ask a question? Um, in the chat box, someone, uh, Danilo, please accept, invite me as a classroom. But you're already here in the here. In the <laughs> Wala ko kakita aning link, sir. Yeah, but how how yeah, did you end up? Did you end up? Uh, Nangotan ako sa mong classmate. Anyway, kung naakay kwan sa classroom, di ko kakita, kaya wak ko nganto. <laughs> mm, so, mm -hmm. so, let me see. How do I do that? <laughs> Invite you to the classroom. But you are. It's true. Next time, lang sa. It's okay. Next time, na lang. You just give me your uh, what you call this. Okay. Uh, email ko sabs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. So I lost my presentation here. Okay, so Information Horizon interview, the first and currently best established visual method for the study of information behavior, photo elicitation method, for example, the photo diaries and photo voice, uh, information world mapping, information mapping board game. So I just listed this to let you know that we are dealing with really a wide range of possibilities of data which are under visual data. Uh, but we're not going to deal with all of this, okay? Um, in fact, we'll just start with something basic because you will try to learn this when it comes to you because information world mapping, for example, is not something common. It depends on a particular um, research that you're doing. Uh, even information mapping board game is a methodology that is also very, very uh, special. So, if um, so, what we need to establish now is just foundation, okay? And also this one, these are techniques which are also quite advanced, but we're not going to use this. But I just wanted you to know that these techniques exist because you might encounter it in the near future or maybe not so near. So compositional interpretation, conceptual analysis, content analysis, pictorial metaphor analysis, thematic analysis, visual discourse, and grounded theory. Now, all of these are not specific to visual data alone, okay? But um, visual data may be used for these kinds of analysis. And what we are actually interested to, to tackle here are these four main types of visual analysis, which is more basic, okay? The one I showed you earlier, uh, I just showed it to you just to, for you to familiarize yourself. Um, with the spectrum of research available on this, uh, on this topic of visual data analysis. So what, to, what I'm going to share with you now on, in detail are these four, ethnographic content analysis, historical analysis, which is iconology and iconography, structural analysis and post-structuralist post analysis, okay? So if the, I'm saying that these are the foundations, these are the basics, uh, but then they look very intimidating. So how much more those slides, the previous slides that I showed you, you know, they're really intimidating. Um, 
but this one I found it by Carl. How do you spell? Uh, how do you pronounce the name? No? Gurbich. So I can't even tell if she's German or what. Let's tackle ethnographic content analysis. So again, like the previous um, methods that I mentioned, uh, ethnographic content analysis is not special only to visual data. So it's also uh, used for textual data. So it seeks to identify the signifiers, signs within visual images, and to understand their accepted meanings within the culture in which they are located. So when to use this, when you have access to visual images and types of research questions being suited. So what is going on in this visual image? What aspects of the cultural context or social organization are reflected in these images? So basically this is a study of ethnography which deals with culture. So if you need to, to, to present culture, a specific feature about a certain culture, a specific aspect of culture to, uh, to differentiate between two cultures and anything related to culture. But um, to learn more about culture with visual data, okay? Um, it says that the strength enables visual images to be read within cultural or historical context. And uh, especially because in a photograph or a video, you have to look, capture time. So for example, you capture that moment in time when people were dressed like this or were doing this uh, as a custom. So there's a lot to, there's a lot to say. Uh, and especially if the picture can hold many, many information, they say picture, um, speaks a thousand words, okay? Because you, for even if you take only a picture of a one subject, the background also tells you a lot of things uh, as well as the foreground. The weakness, the origin and the purpose of the construction or collection of the images may be unclear, okay? Unless, for example, you identify or there are clear identification when this was taken, by whom, who is the subject, uh, etc. So the pictures or the video might end up like um, uh, not useful. Okay. So the forming types of um, sorry. Okay. There are uh, the process involved is a mm, you have to. You have to look at the content and uh, also the context of the picture. So you have to ask yourself these questions. So, um, excuse me a little bit. Okay, so because in in the in qualitative qualitative research, you have to do a lot of um, reflections. You have to keep on asking yourself. Um, so this is the one feature of qualitative research, especially when you're dealing with with this data, um, visual data. So you have to ask what is the image of, what is the context of its production. Uh, why was this taken? For example, why was this photograph taken? Why was this sketch made? Or why, why was that painting made? Okay. Uh, who was involved in, in doing it, in the, producing it, and for what purpose? What, what do the outcomes convey, meaning within the cultural context of origin um, today? And then you have to link, link the information. Each image will be linked or embedded in a variety of other signs through intertextuality, what are these other signs? Okay, so uh, I mentioned about triangulation last time. So this is also what will happen. How do other signs impact or affect the image? 
how does this image reflect or depart from dominant cultural values? Then finally, you interpret. So it is the most obvious reading of the image. What alternative reading can be made? So basically, the three steps is okay to identify the content and context, and then to, to triangulate, to link it with other data. And depending on what you discover in linking, so you interpret. So these are just some examples that I want to show. Um, the picture on the right, on, on the left, my left, um, is one of the most um, popular picture in National Geographic, the picture of the woman. Okay, and then I think this is the photographer. Uh, but then the one on the right, I, I remember seeing this picture, but I'm not very familiar with it. Okay, so these are the photographers who sort, sort of um, gave a very, very strong message with just a single picture. Um, and then they were, they became covers of National Geographic. So some other pictures might be like this, which tells a lot about a particular lifestyle, uh, in this case, the black women, for example, and how they live. So there are many other possible uh, analysis. No? I, I, was, I was hoping that I can find a good example, but then um, maybe along the way during the course, we will encounter one. So I also found this um, picture in the slides of one, one of the um, document I was studying. So reality is visible, observable, and recordable in video or photography. Okay, that's a French uh, word. This French sentence down there that says that this is not a pipe. So this is a deconstruction. Iconology or iconography, I think this is more familiar with, with you. It's an interpretation of art and religious images, iconography. To the meanings of these symbols in practice, the two have become closely interwoven. So when to use when you have access to images from art or religion. So in types of research question best suited, what are the meanings of the signs in these paintings? Okay. Um, the strength enables the identification of the meaning of the icon signs being used. The weakness interpretations may change over time. So the original meaning is lost. Um, let's tackle this. Okay, so this is a screenshot um, of the of iconographies of um, of Our Lady of uh, Mary, and it is said here that uh, these were drawn by Saint John, I think Saint John. So there there were four drawings of Saint John which became famous, and this was. So I still have to verify that no. And you can see a lot of symbolism here. Um, I will show a few examples. The Virgin Mary is most often shown wearing a blue robe, which is a symbol of heaven and her spirituality. Okay, so that's the color itself is a symbol. The cross has been a religious icon since the second century and represents Christianity. So marking the signs of the cross on someone's forehead or chest was used to ward off demons. So a shape, which is the cross, the shape of the cross is a symbol. The Holy Spirit is many times shown as a dove. This comes from the story of Christ's baptism and the Holy Spirit came from heaven like a dove. It is also used to represent an individual soul. So even animals have become symbols. In Christianity, a lot of... Um, Fruits and animals uh, are used as symbols, especially to symbolize Christ. For example, you have the, the sheep um, and also the fish to symbolize Christ. 
um, among the fruits, the grapes also symbolize Christ. And just um, my point exactly. No? Christ sometimes represented with a uh, fish symbol. This comes from the green, Greek ictus. I think some of you, especially the Jesuits, are very familiar with this symbol, which is an anagram for Savior, Jesus Christ, and Son of God. Okay. So there are three levels of uh, iconography, depending on the, the way that it, uh, it transmits the, um, the meaning. The primary level is factual and expressional representation, meaning to say, like we see, we know what you see is what you get. Okay, um, like um, we'll see it later. Secondary symbol representation of a more abstract level requires some iconographical analysis. And then the tertiary iconological, iconological interpretation will be seeking the deepest meaning. So the more, the more abstract it is, we will actually find that later in the, in the next, no? because they're, they're, they are connected. So we'll get back to this primary, secondary level and tertiary level as we discuss the next, because if they are related. Um, I'm referring to this next no the structural ana analysis now this is basically about signs and symbols also but um the previous one iconography has to do something with religion but this one is other things other than religion the so sign and pat signs and patterns of visual symbols are viewed as being directly related to concepts within particular cultures which have meaning that can be read. So we have the signifiers, which is the image, and the signified, which is the meaning. So when to use this analysis, when you wish to identify the commonly accepted meaning or signs, then research question best suited, what do these signs represent? What are the meanings of these images for participants? Um, let me go through directly. No? So these are what I mean by signified and signifier. So they compose what we call the signs. So um, you're referring to a dog, but you made use of the words dog made up of the letters D-O-G as a signifier, okay, to signify the, the actual dog. So there are three types of um, three types of signs. One is called the icon. So this is a realistic representation or strong resemblance between image and object, for example, a picture of a horse, or in this case, in the photo that I'm showing, it's a donut. And then, so anyone who sees it will immediately um, realize that it's a donut and this is probably a donut shop, okay? Or donut factory. Um, there has to be a reason why there's a big, very big donut. And, um, wait. Yeah, long okay. um, The next type of sign is called index. Okay, so this links to natural events via physical connection. That is, if you see steam, you can, uh, visualize or you can give a symbol of uh, hot water. For example, you see smoke there in the mountains or probably in an area, and then suddenly the idea of fire comes up. Okay, So unlike icons, because icons, the sign icon is related to iconography way before. If you notice, all the images that I'm showing in iconography uh, are directly related to the actual uh, object being represented. For example, Mary is drawn as Mary. Okay? The cross is drawn as a cross, and Christ is drawn as a Christ. The fish is a fish. But there's, but there's a symbol, there's a meaning. Okay? But then, 
uh, and then the meaning is related to the properties of that no, of that uh, of the actual object. But here, sometimes the 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 sign is different from what it is trying to signify. So the smoke is not fire, but then because of it is part of fire, so we have the idea of fire. The so steam is not really hot water, but because it is linked to a hot water, so we can also uh, relate it or give it a interpretation of hot water. A symbol, however, does not need to be related to the object it is trying to signify. So for example, here, these are symbols for a woman and a man, okay? But um, we cannot link, we cannot link this to a man or a woman, as we know, because a, a woman is not pink in color and does not have that this anywhere on herself. Or the, the blue symbol is not anywhere found in a man, okay? But then it is socially accepted as the symbol of man and woman, Therefore, we accept it also so that we get to communicate with each other. Actually, even our letters, our alphabet, or the characters uh, of others' alphabet, like Japanese, the kanji, or the Chinese characters, they have, they have nothing to do, especially the, the, the kanji and the, the Chinese characters. No? Sometimes on one, one character represents already a symbol, a person, or an object, so with just one character. But then if you take, take a look at it, um, there's no relevance, no, there's no link. Uh, there has been a lot of effort for some people to try to, to associate them by each stroke, meaning this and that and that, so that you can familiarize yourself with what the kanji means. But actually, it's, um, in the end, it's actually like you need to memorize. You need to memorize the symbol uh, so that you know the meaning. Okay, so it's a lot of effort, but because of habit, because of culture, and it's because it's being taught to you, it's being used by everyone, so you get to understand it still. So here's a way of, um, a way of um, also showing the difference between the three, icon, index, and symbol. Now, I mentioned to you about the primary level, secondary level, and tertiary level. So they are parallel to this. So icon is like the primary level in iconography. Index is like a secondary level, and symbol is the tertiary level. So here we have three objects being signified, the outlet, the thermostat, and the ethernet, no? or the internet. Um, and in icon, the outlet is really the outlet, okay? The thermostat, well, this is uh, perhaps an, a, a digital thermostat. Uh, and then also the Ethernet, where it's an outlet where you plug in the, the cable. So they can be, they represent directly what they're trying to signify. But in the index, so the plug, somehow is related to the outlet, and then the arrows going up and down with a degree sign is related to thermostat. And then here, the, the, like the plug itself uh, of the, the terminal of the cable, uh, I forgot what it's called. So can also represent Ethernet. No? But when it comes to symbol, so it becomes very abstract. Okay, uh, actually, I don't know what this symbol is, but they're supposed to represent an outlet. Um, in architecture, we represent outlet in another way, no? a circle with two, two parallel lines. And the thermostat here represented only by the up and down arrows. And then the special symbol represent Ethernet. So, I hope you managed to get the differences. No? Um, if you, if not, maybe you can read up or Google, Google the topic so that you can get more examples. So basically, the way to do it is this: no? um, you have the on one side 
the factual and the imputed. Factual meaning to say um, the actual object, and then imputed meaning to say the implied or like the what is represented. Uh, and then if there's a similarity between the factual and the and if there's a great similarity or there's a great contigu contiguity. So um, if it is similar and factual, so that's an icon. If it's contiguous and but factual, it's an index. So it's contiguous but imputed, so it's a symbol. And it's also a symbol, but like a motif. Uh, this is more of iconography. No. Uh, if it's similar and imputed. The last is post-structuralist analysis or deconstruction. A lot. No? Now, how come there's deconstruction here? Uh, I, I thought deconstruction is only for architecture. Actually, deconstruction started out in, the, in literature. Okay? When you say, when you... Um, when the word is not given the meaning it's supposed to signify. So you say a horse, but you're thinking of a chair. So that's deconstructing the, the word horse. Anyway, so that's very, uh, you have to blame the French for that. <clears throat> so when to use, when you have access to visual images needing deconstruction or unraveling. So, which means that you have to really, to like, um, to anal analyze, no? to, to unravel. Okay. Type of research question best suited, what is the meaning of the sign component of this visual image? And then the strength and the weakness. I'll just read them later when I uh, put up the slides. No? Um, I want to go directly to this, because this is the best example of deconstruction or post-structural analysis, okay? So you wanted, you wanted to extract something, the meaning, but then you have to extract it from some visual elements. And then those visual elements uh, do not yet have a particular symbol, okay? So otherwise, you can already have a direct relation, direct interpretation. Um, if you've been reading Kevin Lynch, Image of the City, these are actually the, the figures uh, that made up the city. No? You have the past, you have the, uh, the region, the landmarks, and the nodes. I forgot the other one. Um, so what did Kevin Lynch do? So he asked people to draw, uh, and then he gave some instruction like if you are to to go to this place so how would you describe it in drawings okay and so when they did the drawing uh they were asked there was an interview later and then they were asked so why did you draw it this way why, why did you choose to draw it this way okay so and then some people say ah because the, the past is what i take this is what i take as a this is the road that I take whenever I go somewhere, et cetera, et cetera. Or they, they may say that, okay, uh, this place, this monument is like a landmark for me to, to find my way home, like that. No? Or there's a node, uh, there's an intersection. So I always take note of an intersection. There may be five intersections, et cetera, et cetera. So I remember whenever we go home, to my to the whenever I we go home to the hometown of my my mom uh, at a particular place, my aunt would say count thirteen bridges and we'll be there. So that's to to get rid of the boredom. So we count how many bridges. So so those are like landmarks. No? And then or it could be a the edge or the the boundary the region. So this is post-structuralist uh, analysis uh, that, is, that Kevin Lynch is doing. Um, I cannot find another example easily uh, because I'm, I'm too busy, I'm sorry. So hopefully you get the idea of what 
all of these means, no? This um these four main types of visual analysis. So ethnographic basically has to deal with culture. Um, and then historical analysis um, has to do with mostly religion and sometimes culture, uh, but more of symbolism when it comes to culture. In ethnography, it's really more about culture, customs, and traditions. Instructional analysis, we're dealing with signs and the three types, you know, the, the icon, the index, and the uh, and uh, symbol. And post-structural Past post-structuralist analysis is when you try to infer something from drawings which were elicited from participants. Okay. Now that takes care of our topic for today. So let's talk about classwork here. Uh, classwork. But before I show the, the password, because I, I, I made a mistake, I thought that um, I gave you an assignment about your next assignment after the topic has been finalized. I was supposed to, but this was supposed to be due last week, but no one submitted. Uh, I, I was asking for what data you will be needing and then why, okay? Um, and then when I tried to extend it, because we did not meet last Saturday, so I thought that I extended it and I also gave more instructions, but I realized yesterday that I did not, you know, because I, I prepare our class only on Fridays. So I will make this instruction for each group, okay? So this is a group task. Make a diagram to show the data that you will need to solve the research problem and how they will lead to the solution. So you can use a flowchart diagram, okay? So, but first you have to identify what data you will need. Okay, so a flowchart um, makes use of these symbols. Um, you don't really need to use it like this. I'm just giving you some information on how flowchart is done, but you can also maybe invent something else as long as I get to understand them. <laughs> Otherwise, come out all the So um, at the start and the end, there's always this terminator symbol. Okay, so you begin, and then the process, each process is like this. Then if there's a question where you need to decide it's a diamond, and then if it's a yes or it's a no, so the, the, this is always uh, succeeded by two branches. No, one is if the answer is yes, the other one is the answer is no. And then this is a preparation symbol, and then there are so many other symbols, but actually you can only use, you can, you can use these three and then you're good. Okay, the terminator, the process, and then the decision. So it's like, okay, you need to get this data, and then you need to ask these questions. If not, then you have to, I don't know. Um, if the flowchart is not um, useful to you, you can use another diagram. For as long as you show uh, how the data will lead to the solution of the research problem. Okay, and the next meeting, all of you will be reporting. Um, well, each group will be reporting. So show the diagram and explain it. And let's see whether the diagram is complete. The diagram is uh, uh, understandable. Now, why are we doing this? Because first, you cannot analyze without data. That's why this is called data analysis. Second is you have to analyze it according to how you design your research. And then this is like the design of the research. Okay. Um, so basically you might be you might end up using some of the lectures that we are 
uh, that I will be giving you. Some of them might be still coming, you at least tackled two topics so far, and all of them are qualitative analysis. So that is how I want to, to show to you uh, basically how data should be analyzed. No? So there is not one way to analyze the data. It really depends on your research problem. But then if do, you do not define your research problem properly, then you cannot really analyze anything. Your analysis will be invalid. So, or you might end up not doing any analysis at all. Maybe just presenting so many things. And then in the end, just suddenly making a conclusion. And that should not happen, especially in your thesis. Okay, very good. So are there any questions in the the class classwork that I gave? Because otherwise we can we can end the session. Someone just came in earlier telling me that dinner is ready, so <laughs> I've gotten rid of my cat. So anyway, if you have any question, just feel free to drop me an email or a comment in either Canvas or Google Classroom. Yes, Veronica? Hola. Okay, hola, hola. so, okay, that ends our session and uh, thank you for coming there. By the way, there will be only 24 of you. Last time I said 26 because there were two from Zamboanga, but I think in the end they did not make it, so they were not enrolled, so there are only 24. So we'll just go ahead with our, with our plans. Okay, so see you next week and have a good weekend. Goodbye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you.